John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13. A nice short passage today to start the message with. So you will not be standing long. <laughs> Amen. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Let me put it on the screen for you. There you go. For anyone that does not have a Bible, you can see it on the screen in front of you at the head of the sanctuary. Praise God. And the King James text today reads, A new commandment I give you, I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you and uh, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Amen. Very simple passage that I'll be preaching from today. If you'll bow your heads with me a moment, King Jesus, Lord, I need your help today. I need you to touch my body. I need you, God, to touch my spirit. I believe, God, this is an important word that you desire to bring to the people of God today. And I want nothing more than to be faithful to my calling and to deliver this word. But I need the help today, oh God, of your great Holy Ghost. I need you to touch me. I need you to strengthen me. I need you to stand behind me. I need you, God, to anoint every word so that the hearer will know today that the Spirit of God is speaking to His church. Lord, that I, as a mere man, am able to humble myself and make myself available to you, that you might give to your people a living word, a word that brings life and not death, a word that brings hope, and not despair, a word that brings healing, and not sickness, a word that brings today, oh God, unity and not division. Master, speak to our hearts today. Let everyone that is in this service, both present in this building, and those that are watching by reason of the internet, let each and every one feel the power of God as the word of God goes forth in love. That we might receive it not only in our hearing, but also in our hearts and in our spirit. And that it might perform a divine work within us. For we ask it in Jesus, Jesus, Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this afternoon. Some of y'all are going to think the preacher's kind of tripped his switch. When I explain to you the visual aid that I have attached to this message, doesn't that holiness woman just look so precious and holy? She and her children, look how holy she looks with her hair piled on her head and her sleeves down to her wrists and with a skirt down to the floor. And Oh my, doesn't she just look righteous and holy by Pentecostal standards? We listened Wednesday to a message Wednesday night by a prominent leader in the apostolic movement. While I heard a lot mentioned about various Pentecostal distinctives, as he referred to them, as they're defined by his organization. I was saddened by the fact, Martin, that true biblical distinction for believers was not even mentioned. The thing that is genuinely in the Word of God taught as being the one singular major distinction between believers and non-believers was not mentioned. He bragged about all these 
conservative dressed women with all their hair piled on their head. Just like our dear sister on the screen that you're looking before you now. Oh, by the way, this sister on the screen, her name is Belle Gunness. If you don't know who Belle Gunness is, she lived between 1859 and 1930. She was born in Norway, immigrated to the United States in 1881. A series of suspicious fires and deaths, mostly resulting in insurance awards, followed her arrival in the United States. Bell began posting notices in lovelorn columns to entice wealthy men to her farm, after which they were never seen again. Authorities eventually found the remains of over 40 victims on her property. But dear sweet holiness looking Bell disappeared without a trace. This woman killed children. She killed men. She was one of America's first major female, female serial killers, which is so rare that a female is even a serial killer to begin with. This lady in the 1800s killed nearly four dozen human beings. But she looks the part, doesn't she? But she meets UP standard of approval, doesn't she? If she walked into a United Pentecostal church, oh, they'd be hugging her neck and loving on her. And just looking at her, they would assume that by God, she is one of us. Hallelujah. Here's somebody who knows how to live holy. Here's somebody who knows how to be godly and righteous. All because... According to Brother Bernard, she looks the part. Well, I was saddened by the fact that Brother David Bernard bragged about conservative dress and gender distinct clothing. And yet in all her t his talking about apostolic Pentecostal distinctives, he did not mention the one true distinction in the church that defines us and separates us from the world. And I've got news for you today. It is not our dress code. The one distinction, the one true distinction of the church today is love. Jesus Christ said, a new commandment, commandment, Commandment! Are you hearing me today? He didn't say a new suggestion. He said a new commandment I give unto you. That ye love one another. He didn't just say love one another, but he added a little phrase. He said, as I have loved you. So we're not supposed to merely love our fellow human being. But we're supposed to love our fellow human being as Jesus has loved us. Oh my goodness, that's a high standard to reach for. But isn't that funny, Brother David didn't mention one word about love. He didn't say one thing about, and bless God, we should be a people of love. The world should be able to look at us and feel the love of God emanating from us. He didn't say one word, Martin, about love, did he? No, he talked about dress. He talked about the power of God. He talked about the move of the Holy Ghost. Well, I've got news for you today. The Apostle Paul addressed the power of God in the absence of love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2, and again, I'll put it on the screen so you can follow me. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, charity is love. I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains 
and have not charity, have not love, I am nothing. So you see, while Brother Bernard bragged about the power of God and the move of God, he failed to recognize that without love, those things are meaningless. Those things have no value. He went on to address the Apostle Paul, that is, went on to address the presence of charitable acts and charitable works without love. He writes in 1 Corinthians 13 and 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love distinguishes the church from the world. Love defines the life of a believer. Love is the one ingredient today that our world craves. And an ingredient that only the people of God can bring to the table. My Lord, love attracts the unbeliever and woos the unsaved to the foot of the cross. You can separate yourself from the world with your dress and with your rules and regulations until you alone can walk on water. But unless that miracle working power is coupled with the ability to sit and dine with sinners, your religion is empty shallow and useless. Am I telling the truth today? Yep. In Mark chapter 2 verses 15 through 17 Mark the writer of this gospel writes and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples for there were many, and they followed him. Who followed him? Publicans and sinners. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician. But they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Remember the Lord said, love one another as I have loved you. Jesus could sit with publicans and sinners. Because he recognized, Martin, these are the people we're trying to reach. Right. It's pretty ignorant to hang out with your own people all the time. Yeah, it's right. pretty foolish to spend all your time with a bunch of saved folks and not ever spend any time. Not be willing to share a table. Not be willing to sit at a meal because somebody's queer. Or because somebody's a drunk. Or because somebody's divorced. Or because somebody, God forbid, doesn't dress like you do. I know people in the apostolic movement who wouldn't, wouldn't take five seconds, Brother Martin, to sit down and eat with Vestal Goodman. Because Vestal Goodman got to the place in her life where she didn't follow the rules like she was supposed to. But I'll tell you one thing about Vesta Goodman. She had a reputation worldwide, worldwide, worldwide for being one of the most loving one of the most embracing, one of the most affirming, one of the kindest, sweetest, most charitable Christian women on the face of planet Earth. Now, I don't know if I'd rather have her reputation or have the reputation that, bless God, I'd never let earrings go on my ears or I'd never let makeup go on my face or I'd never let scissors go to my hair. Jesus said by this, shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another but not just love but love like I have extended to you 
vessel did a better job of living up to Jesus' standard. Oh, my goodness. Amen. Tammy Faye Baker, with all her makeup on her face, people love to make fun of Tammy Faye. People love to pick on Tammy Faye. I happen to love Tammy Faye. I always have loved Tammy Faye. When I was in the holiness movement, I loved Jim and Tammy Faye. You know why? Because I couldn't judge people by their external appearance. I couldn't judge them by their looks when their love was so obvious. When the love of God was so obvious. The, one of the very first, if not the very first, evangelical fundamentalist figures to embrace men dying with AIDS was Tammy Faye Baker. On national television. She went to the bedside of a man who was dying with AIDS and hugged him and loved him. And people said, how can you do that? Because at that time, there was such fear that, you know, AIDS could be caught with casual contact. And she said, God has commanded me to love like he loves. She said, if he wants me to love, then he'll protect me as well. Oh, but we got folks today that want to celebrate as a Pentecostal or as a Christian distinctive their appearance. God help us all. By this shall all men know. By what? By your looks, by your appearance, by your dress, by your rules, by your regulations, by your laws, by your standards? No. By your love one to another. Now I'm going to tell you there are a lot of groups a lot of religious denominations and groups who love to read this passage and they say the way the world knows that we are the children of God, the way the world knows that we are the people of God is that we love one another. As Christians, we love one another. Oh, we Jehovah's Witnesses, we love each other silly. Can't stand anybody outside of us, but we love each other crazy. We apostolics, oh, we love our long-haired, high-piled women with their long sleeves and their long skirts. Long as you look right, we'll love you to death. Sister Bruce, who was in the Church of God at a time in its history when they embraced most of the same standards as the United Pentecostal Church. She told me one time, it used to make her so mad. Her hair, she cut her hair. She didn't hide the fact she cut her hair. But she had very thin hair. Her hair naturally, uh, she kind of, you know, lost a lot of hair. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. But anyway, she would wear hair pieces and wigs sometimes to kind of help because her own natural hair was very, very thin. So you very, you did, I don't think you ever saw her without some sort of hair piece or wig on, you know. Her own hair kind of troubled her a little bit. It embarrassed her a little bit. She said, I've got one hair piece that I put on and it kind of gives me that holiness look, you know. <laughs> she said, it kind of piles up there and it looks kind of like a holiness hairstyle. She said, let me go to camp meeting Wearing that hairpiece. She said, old man, said you wouldn't believe how many people hugging on me and loving on me and oh, showing me all the kindness in the world. She said, but you let me go to camp meeting wearing my other wig that looks more like Loretta Lynn's hairstyle, you know. She said, and all of a sudden those same people don't have nothing to do with me. They don't talk to me. They don't. Gee, Sister Bruce, what a shame that you understand what it feels like to be loved conditionally. What a shame that it bothers you to be loved conditionally because ever since I come out and I've been in affirming ministry, you won't even take my call. You won't even answer my email. You won't even accept my friendship on Facebook. I wonder what it feels like to love conditionally. I wonder what it feels like to only love people when they're living up to your standard. See, isn't it pitiful when you know what it feels like to be yeah. done that way and then you turn around and do the same exact thing? Amen. Mm -hmm. 
We ought to watch ourselves. We might be sitting here saying amen, and then we turn around and pull the same stuff. Amen. And I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, picking anybody in the crowd. I'm talking to the preacher as well today, <laughs> believe me. Amen. Love is the distinction. Some people say, oh, it's the you know, but that's Jesus commanding us to love one another. Meaning. And then they attach the meaning to love one another. He was talking to his disciples. He was talking to uh, the believers. He was talking to the church that we're to love one another. Um, excuse me. You've heard me often say, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You've heard me say that? Don't try to tell me he was talking about how we act toward one another. Don't try to tell me that's what he meant and that's what he was saying. Because if you look at Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 48. The word of God tells us, ye have heard it, that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Now listen to verse 46, Matthew 5. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Now, to put this in context so you'll understand it, when the Lord said, do not the publican so, he's literally talking in political circles. He's talking about political. He's using political parties, if you will. He said, well, if you love people that love you, he said, well, don't the Republicans do that? Aren't they crazy about one another, but they hate the other guy? said, if you just love the, if you just salute your own brethren, said, well, don't the public and don't the Democrats do that? They only say hello and stop and talk to one another. They don't bother with the other guy. Hello now. That's what the Lord literally was saying because publicans were individuals who were involved in po the political process, who were involved in governance. So don't tell me the Lord said, if you love one another as I loved you. He was talking about loving one another in the church. No, because he made abundantly clear in Matthew 5 that there's no value in that. He made it clear in Matthew 5 that that's not how love is genuinely manifested and demonstrated. Amen. You don't just demonstrate love toward one another within the confines of your group, but you demonstrate love one another in terms of mankind and the human race. Hallelujah. Sinners ought to feel love emanating from us every bit as much as saints do. Unbelievers ought to feel love emanating from us every bit as much as believers do. The scribes and Pharisees will always seek out separation from the world. They abhor sinners and they reject the sinful. But when you spend all your time pushing away those who most need the good news of the gospel... Is it any wonder that those same people want nothing to do with your message? Mm. Hello now. Love the sinner, hate the sin is an impossible task. It's impossible for us to do so. In order to love the sinner, we must learn to look past the sin. Had God not been able to love us in spite of our sin, hello now, we would all still be unsaved and hopelessly lost. 
Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. So let me tell you something. When you came to me, I didn't look at your sin. I didn't look at you as some filthy old pervert or some old pig or some old drunk or some old drug addict or some old prostitution or some old failure or some old flop. No, sir. I looked at you as someone that needed the love of God in your life. For God so loved the world. That is the heart of our message the love of God is the heart of our message. The word of God said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Everything God does, he does by his spirit. I've got news for you. God is love. Amen. Anywhere God's spirit is, there will be love. Right. Anytime God's doing anything, it's got to be done with love. I'm going to tell you a little secret. When I cast demons out of people, and I've done it many a time in my old 53 years, there has to be love present. I literally will tell the church. I literally will tell, while I'm casting demons out of somebody, I'll tell the church, love this person. Just literally look at this person and just sit in your mind, God, I have pity. I have mercy on that person. That person has been taken over by a power from hell that they cannot control, and it's destroying their lives. And I literally tell the church, literally, just begin to let the love of God flow through you because if you're going to see that person delivered from that devil, you better love them. The Word of God tells us that Jesus often performed miracles in response to his compassion. The Bible said, and he being moved with compassion. Do you know what compassion is? Love. See, you cannot help anybody that you cannot feel compassion for. If you don't feel compassion for your gay neighbor, then you better guess again whether or not you're ever going to be able to be a witness to that gay neighbor. If you can't feel compassion for the man dying of AIDS, oh, but you can feel compassion for the woman dying of breast cancer. You can feel compassion for the man who drank his life away and is dying of a failing liver. You can feel compassion for the man who smoked five packs a day and is dying of lung cancer. You don't believe in drinking. You don't believe in smoking, but you can feel compassion on those people. Oh, but let that gay man come in with AIDS. And suddenly compassion goes out the window. Don't tell me you have the power to love the sinner and hate the sin. You're a liar. Am I telling the truth? I hope I'm amen. telling the truth. Yeah. I used yes. to tell people, if I'm telling the truth, somebody say amen. 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 Love is demonstrated in a proactive manner. It does not first require that a person change to be accepted and embraced, but rather it first accepts and embraces, allowing the power of love then to create any necessary change. I hate to use this as an illustration, but it probably is one of the clearest illustrations. You find an old dog who's been out in the world being abused and mistreated and unfed and dirty and unwashed, and you bring it to an animal shelter, and, and that old dog is the friendliest thing in the world. All he's ever known is negativity. All he's ever known is abuse. You're going to sit there and say, well, now I'm going to wait till that dog knows how to act right before I'm going to show it any compassion. I'm going to wait for that old dog to act right before I feed it. I'm going to wait for that old dog to act right before I try to show it any love. Hello now. No. Anybody who works at an animal clinic will tell you that ain't the way it works. Amen. I got news for you. We human beings are the same way. If you're going to wait for somebody to straighten up their act before you show them any love, you're going to be waiting a long time. But if you'll show them love, you'd be shocked what the power of love can do. 
and how the power of God's love can transform people. I've seen people come into the church my whole life. I've seen people come into the church of the living God, and I've seen them come in, Martin, so abused and so bruised and so beaten and so torn up and emotionally and psychologically and spiritually uh, in tatters. But the people of God loved them. They'd say things that they ought not to say. And the people of God just let it roll right up their head. They didn't correct them. They didn't rebuke them. They didn't chastise them. They just acted like they didn't hear it. And they just loved them anyway. Every time they come in the church house, they just hugged on them and loved them. And that person just as hard and just as worn and weathered as anybody could be. And yet the church just, and you want to know what? It didn't take too long before you begin to see some chinks in the armor. It didn't take too long before you begin to see that old stony heart begin to crumble and a heart of flesh to replace it. And I tell the truth. Amen. I'm telling you, there's an awful lot of power in love, folks. There's a lot of power in love. But love is proactive. It is not reactive. We don't sit around and wait for folk to get their act together before we embrace them. No, you do everything you can. You feed that dog. You talk to the dog. You might not be able to reach in and pet it right away, but you'll stand outside the, that little cage and say... Come on, puppy, come on. Oh, puppy, come on, oh, puppy. Do that a few days and see if maybe that puppy didn't come over to the gate and kind of hold his head there and see if you'll pet him. Am I telling the truth today? My God, have mercy. A sinner is a sinner, no matter what the nature of their sin. To look upon one unbeliever in one way and another unbeliever in another way because of the nature of their sinful behavior is sinful in and of itself. Did you hear me now? We are not called to identify or rectify the sins of others. We are called to perfect ourselves. And to conform to the image of our Savior. By the way, his image is an image of love. He is the loving great shepherd. He is the loving good Samaritan. He is the loving father of the long lost prodigal son. Hallelujah. There exists no greater hypocrisy than for a child of God to believe that they are more righteous than our Redeemer. Many will say today, oh, I don't believe that. I don't think I'm more holy than the Lord. And my answer to that false claim is simply, then why do you find it so easy to look upon unbelievers with disdain and malice? Why do you separate yourself from those who most need to hear and see the gospel of Jesus Christ in action? A gospel, by the way, that is anchored and rooted in love. Romans 5 and 8 tells us today, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Luke chapter 6, verses 40 through 42, listen to what the Lord says. The disciple is not above his master. Mm. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. This is an important principle today. The disciple is not above his his master. You cannot be above, you cannot be so holy that you can separate yourself from sinners when Jesus was far holier than you'll ever be and he did not separate himself from sinners. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Yeah. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect, you remember what I said about the word perfect, means mature, complete, shall be as 
his master. So you can't be better than him, but you can try to be just like him. You follow. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. You see, love is proactive, not reactive. We're not supposed to be busy looking at what other people's problems are. We're not supposed to be busy looking at what other people's weaknesses are. We're not supposed to be busy looking at what other people's sins are. No, honey, you got enough in your own life. Trust me, if you'll spend enough time looking at yourself and looking in the mirror, I promise you, you will be busy enough so you won't have any time to be looking at other folks. Yeah, I'm a pastor. I've been doing this for a lot of years. I'm going to tell you something. I'm not stupid enough to think I'm perfect. Tommy can tell you there are many, many, many times I'll say to him that I feel like such a failure and a flop, and I wish to God I could do things better, and I wish to God I could be better, and I wish to God I could live better, and I wish it. That's why I love that passage in the Psalms where David the psalmist writes, As for me, I shall behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. I've told Tommy, I said, I'd love to have that on my tombstone. I know it costs an arm and a leg because they charge by the letter. But maybe Martin will get us a break somewhere. But I'd love to have that passage on my tombstone. I really would. Because it says everything, everything that my heart says today. It says, I will one day behold thy face in righteousness, and I will be satisfied. See, I can't be satisfied now, Martin, but I will be satisfied. When? When I behold thy face in righteousness. I will behold thy face in righteousness. I will be satisfied. But anyway, I will behold, I, when I stand before him, and I look at him, and I stand righteous before him, I'm going to be satisfied. But until then, I got news for you. I really just don't feel satisfied with myself because every day and every way I fall short of the mark. I'm going to tell you something, children. We better be careful in this age of Trump. We better be careful not to let the enemy destroy our love mechanism. Because right now, that man has released a demon in our society of hatred and division. And that spirit is affecting a lot of people. And as children of God, we have to be triple diligent that our love is in gear. We've got to be that much more diligent that we're loving like Jesus wants us to love. How is that? Like he loved. How did he love? Unconditionally. Before there were any changes. Before you were anything special. That's how Jesus loved. I got news for you. That's how he wants us to love too. I'll tell you, we've got so many. You know, there was the time I was in the holiness movement and I remember some preachers and people I knew and they would talk about how pharisaical the holiness movement could be. Now, I want you to understand, I do not hate holiness people. I do not hate holiness standards. I don't hate any of that. If you embrace those things and you label them as your devotion to the Lord Jesus, or I am doing this just strictly, I am doing this as an act of devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. I would respect you and I would honor you. But when you have the gall to stand there and tell me that those things are heaven or hell and that people can't make heaven unless they look like you do and unless they dress like you do, um, I'm sorry, but now you've crossed the line. And don't tell me in the Old Testament there was a holiness code that the 
uh, Jewish believers had to embrace and that this is the New Testament holiness code because I've got news for you. The holiness code was extremely specific. Your standards are not. Oh, yes, they are. Why We demand that women not cut their hair. We demand that women wear sleeves at least down below their elbow. We demand that women wear uh, dresses and skirts at least below their knee. Really? And where in the Bible do you read that command? Show me the verse that tells me that a woman... I got news for you, my friend. If a modern-day holiness woman walked in to a setting in ancient Jerusalem in the first century, they probably would look at her like she was a prostitute. <laughs> Seriously. You're going to tell me, haven't you ever seen a picture of what Mary looked like, the mother of Jesus? Haven't you ever seen the robes they wore? Haven't you ever seen, haven't you ever seen the way the women still dress in the Middle East with those that are living under Sariah law and all that sort of thing? And you're going to stand there and tell me your holiness dress woman looks anything more conservative than they do? You're full of baloney. You are full of baloney. All your standards and all your rules are a bunch of garbage. To put it plainly, they're a bunch of garbage. Furthermore, I've got news for you. For, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the first 17 verses, a woman's hair is given her for her covering. The word covering is translated as veil. If a woman in biblical times took her veil, wrapped it up in a bun, and tacked it to the back of her head, she'd be considered a whore. Because the veil is meant to cover. So if you're going to believe in uncut hair, then those women ought to be wearing their hair down like a veil because the woman's hair is given her for a covering, for a veil. So if you're going to believe the Bible, believe the whole thing and quit acting the jackass and being stupid. Just going to be plain about it, okay? God's people are not distinguished by their love for other believers. No, we have been commanded to very much function opposite of this. And we are to love even our enemies, even those who spitefully use us, those that curse us. Holiness is not defined by rules, regulations, and so-called standards. It is defined by our reflecting the nature and likeness of our God. And God is neither rude, obnoxious, malicious, judgmental, or hateful. No, my friend, God is love. And if we are to be known as the people of God, we too must be a people of love. Why? Because by this shall all men know that you're a child of God. By what? By our love. Would you stand with me this afternoon?